On today's show, classrooms are suddenly swimming. Swimming with conservation work thanks to Trout Unlimited. We help you get started keeping bees Minnesota's big pollinators. And a North Shore fishing trip. Oh, but ladies invited only. Keep it tight, keep it tight. This current really helps you feel bigger. Minnesota Bound, presented by Connecticut Water Treatment Systems. Hey there, welcome to today's adventure. Something fishy is happening in the classroom these days. Yep, and it's all in the name of freshwater conservation. Something fishy is going on in this classroom. Is there so fin located near the middle of the fish's back? Yeah. So does that have that squared 90 degree angle dorsal fin like no. we talked about? No. no. I'm Jim. I'm going to talk to you about fish, which can't be a surprise. We're glad to be with you today. We are the friends that brought you that big tank of small friends that you've got over there. Those 350 little fingerling friends were donated by Trout Unlimited via a state grant. So here we run the Trout in the Classroom program. This is our second year in the program and what we're doing is we're raising rainbow trout to hopefully release in the spring. Along the way we learn a little bit about trout habitat, we learn about requirements for sustaining trout populations, we look at water quality, water chemistry. We're testing for high range pH and nitrite. How are trout swimming in a classroom beneficial, you ask? From this program, I really hope that my students gain an appreciation for Minnesota, our natural resources, and the outdoors. I hope they learn more about our water quality and how to better sustain our state and that um, preserving habitat. Very important lessons to learn at any age. I've been learning all about trout that I've never learned anything about before, all the stages that they go through and what kind of conditions they need and that it takes a lot of work to maintain their life. So all of the fish in the room are native to Minnesota except two. Do you know which two? Yeah. Rainbow trout. Ra yep, and? Brown trout? Yeah, rainbows and browns, we stock. The rivers and the lakes here have to be taken care of in a space where they have to have like cold, clean water and like you can't like just dump stuff into the lake because that might kill the fish. I just thought they had like the baby stage and then they just grew up and I didn't know they went through so many different cycles and that they could like, you know, they have so many different chances at living and dying. So we talked about fish adaptations, how they allow fish to live, how they live and where they live. This isn't the only classroom taking care of young trout known as PAR. This program spans the entire, across the state. We have 43 teachers in the program. Um, our furthest north school is Northam, Minnesota, north of Bemidji, and then all the way down through Winona and Rochester. And I have 30 teachers on a wait list to join the program next year. There's so much more to learn around them than just their biology or the trout themselves. They're an indicator species of clean water, clean, cold, healthy water. Um, so by bringing these into the classroom, then you're bringing nature into the classroom with the kids right in their face. All these trout, naturally, they live in moving bodies of water, right? This is nature in and out of the classroom. When springtime comes, the student caretakers release their rainbow nursery into the Vermilion River. We, uh, especially at Trout Unlimited, want kids to be really aware about cold water watersheds and fisheries, things like that. Uh, we do have a good amount of trout streams in our state. Um, not a lot of people know that though, um, and they need a lot of protection to stay clean and cold and healthy fisheries. So uh, we really want to expose those things to the students all over the state. Call it introducing a kid to the great outdoors and the importance of conservation, one classroom at a time. 
how can we help in our own watersheds and things that we can do. Um, there are little things that kids can do immediately in their homes that they can help with those things and just um, becoming environmental stewards in their adult life because these are the kids that are really going to, um, going to do some awesome things in the future when it comes to conservation and our natural resources. Coming up next, a lesson in busy bees. We help you get into beekeeping. Minnesota Bound is brought to you by Connecticut Water Treatment Systems, Star Bank, all Seasons Garage Door, and by the Minnesota DNR. Honeybees are all abuzz these days. Have you ever been curious about getting started beekeeping? Well, I'm here at the Bees Knees in Minneapolis to show you how to get started. Thanks for having me here today. Yeah. So I am so excited to be in the bee's knees because not only do I love to eat honey, but I also understand the growing popularity and curiosity in beekeeping. You know, what is it about beekeeping that interests people? You know, I started this business eight years ago and back then a lot of it was the bees are in trouble and people were curious why they, why they were in trouble and also beekeeping started to be more accessible in, in urban areas and I think the growing movement of having a connection to your food and where it comes from helps with that. Is it difficult to get started? So I think the hardest part of getting started is just getting over your own fear of the bee. If you show people how to work around bees, then there's an understanding that, oh, if I do this a certain way, I won't get stung as much. <laughs> as much yeah. is the key word yeah. there. <laughs> I want to be honest with you, it happens. Okay, Christy, speaking of stings, I'm guessing this is probably one of the very first things you want if you're gonna get started beekeeping. So you need your, uh, your protective gear. So bees sting, um, but they die when they sting, so they don't do it lightly. But the face is really the worst place to get stung very sensitive items on your face, yes. nose, eyes, mouth. So the other thing you need is a, is a smoker. We use a smoker to calm the bees down, um, but mostly to, to cover up their scent. So bees communicate by pheromones, by smell, and they have an alar alarm pheromone that to us smells like bananas. So if you put a little smoke on them before you enter the hive and while you're working them, they can't communicate to each other and say there's an intruder and you'll avoid getting stung. Another thing is, is what's called a hive tool. Uh, this is like, uh, if you're a carpenter, you use your hammer for everything. Beekeeper uses a hive tool, mostly to get in and out of the hive. We use this tool to um, pry open the boxes, but also move the frames around. This is called a frame. And these frames, there's 10 of them in a box. And where do you actually get the bees from? Do you have to source them from a bee farmer or someone like yourself? There are a couple different suppliers where you can buy bees. Uh, we recommend trying to find someone local that is raising bees in their area so that they're adapted to our climate. So now we're standing in the nectar patch, which means are we about to harvest some honey? We are. In order to harvest the honey, there's, there's a couple of ways you can do it. The most common is you take a hot knife or you could take a, a serrated bread knife. You just take this knife and gently go up the comb and opens up the hexagon that is holding Look all the honey. Look at that. So then we take this frame and we put it in a honey extractor. It's basically a centrifuge. Our version of it is petal powered. So you're probably good on that round. You know, what's amazing is the amount of honey. It's a sticky business, but the sweet reward is well worth it. Thanks for showing us how to get started. It was you're fun. welcome. Thanks for coming.
If you'd like to check out a few of Laura's other Getting Started segments, head over to the Minnesota Bound YouTube channel. Still ahead, we share the magic of trail camps. But first, a North Shore adventure for silvery fish. This group wants to help you get into steelhead fishing. Closed captioning provided by Treasure Island Resort and Casino. Up next, we catch up with an all-women's fly fishing group that loves to chase Lake Superior's migrating trout. Minnesotans Making a Difference, presented by the Minnesota Lottery. I'm in. I'm ready. I even have my special fly fishing shirt on. You want to dress the part to witness the epic life cycle of steelhead trout. For decades, the spawning migration of steelhead on Minnesota's North Shore has lured many fishermen to spend long hours wading and casting the rushing waters of the Baptism River. But on this day, the scenery is changing. Today, women anglers are discovering the excitement and challenge of catching steelhead trout. Right now what we're looking for are any fish that are kind of laying on that gravel. Sometimes they'll just kind of be cruising around there. There's lots of fish in it, it's beautiful. It's a great river to fish, especially to learn because it allows you to have that room you need as far as learning how to fly cast. Room you'll need as steelhead trout are notorious fighters. They're pure muscle, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so they're pretty aggressive. You gotta be on your toes. Keep it tight, keep it tight, keep it tight. This current really helps him feel bigger. Nice. Hey. Oh, little guy, cute. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh, he's ready to go. It's a contagious pursuit. Catch one and you're hooked. Gone You're in the blink of an eye. <laughs> but the goal here isn't to outfish the guys. These ladies have different goals in mind to encourage women to get out onto the rivers and give them that confidence and that skill set so they feel comfortable while they're doing it and to be able to be independent. That mission gave Lisa Murphy an idea to start a fly fishing classroom for women only. Women on the Fly is a program about educating, informing, and inspiring other women to get them more involved in the migratory trout and salmon fishery here on the North Shore. At the time, there weren't very many resources for women, and after a couple years of doing it myself, I realized there's not a whole lot that's difficult about it. It's just a matter of learning. You have to get out there and learn, but if we can help kind of soften that learning curve for women by offering clinics, offering other resources, and get them out there a little quicker, then that's what we need to do. The word spread quickly. I actually haven't really known a lot of people when I first wanted to learn how to fly fish, and then all of a sudden I heard of women on the fly, and first time I hooked up to a steelhead, that did it, I was hooked. And that's what women on the fly are here to do, help other women have success on the water. Hooked up again with a little trout. Let's let this little guy go. There you go, buddy. All right, let's get a bigger one now. It's exciting. I mean, big or small, it's really exciting. It's a good feeling. In a nutshell, it's women encouraging other women to get outdoors. People like to have that connection, and those clinics bring that, and it's really fun to see. Take that time for yourself, and go throw a couple drifts. You might not catch anything, but for me, I don't know, it's just peaceful, easy to do. You can't beat it, you just can't beat it. Day. It 
is my favorite day of the year. Each spring when I load all my stuff into the boat, I am the poster child for having too much stuff in the boat. When I put all of it in, there are things that can be a real mess unless you store them properly. So I'm hoping you'll follow my advice today so you don't run into the same problems I used to have. First off, I get these giant plastic bags, all my defogger, all my sunscreen, all the insect repellent, they all go inside these bags. I seal them up, they're safe. If they get bumped around, you're not gonna gunk up the boat with this stuff. The other one that I'm very careful about are the fish scents. They're a great tool, but they can be a real mess, and they smell if they start to spill. I keep them in a self-contained plastic box. That's not enough, though. Things like the chapstick applicators, you can't leave them in the boat. When it gets really hot, these things will melt and make a giant mess. So you have to always pay attention to them. Same story, people say, all right, I'll take them out of the boat, but then they put them in a hot car, hot truck, same result. These things can really make a mess. So keep them cool, keep them in the shade, and keep them locked in a box. Take the time to store this stuff properly it actually helps keep your boat pretty clean. Straight ahead, the story and mysterious photos from trail camps. Minnesota Bound is brought to you by Oreo Cookies and Ritz Snacks, Hewitt Docks, Lifts and Pontoon Lakes, Coors Light, and by Totem Resorts, the premier destination for world-class fishing. Trail cameras seem to be a staple in the woods these days. Yeah, these little cameras capture wildlife when nobody is watching. Ron Shera has more on what these gadgets capture. Mother Nature. She puts on a show 24 hours a day, seven days a week, if we're lucky enough to catch it. As luck would have it, technology has made this pretty simple. Enter the Critter Cam, a camera that allows us to snoop on Mother Nature. Nature peepers can thank National Geographic photographer George Shira for inventing the first trail camera way back in the 1880s. Technology has come a long way since then, of course. Now, everyday trail cameras that consumers use are put up on their property. Many put up trail cams to get a glimpse of the critters we're sharing our living spaces with. You'll be surprised at how many critters are right in your backyard. Others use the trail cams for security purposes or scouting hunting areas. To say these cameras are popular is an understatement. Who knew snooping in Mother Nature's business could be so much fun? The catch is Mother Nature isn't always predictable. We learned this with our own Minnesota bound eagle cam in 2012. One of the eaglets named Harmon became stuck in the nest when it was a little over three weeks old. The dilemma, to let nature take its course or step in and try to help. The risk of stepping in was that the parents might abandon the nest and all the eaglets. In this instance, it was a happy ending for Harmon and the other little eagles. The saying goes, in nature nothing is perfect and everything is perfect. It's something to remember as we watch Mother Nature's story. And maybe, if you're lucky, your trail camera will get a glimpse of something unexpected. No, not Bigfoot. But if you see Bigfoot, don't say anything. For some reason, I always forget to put mine up. Well, then you're missing out on all the creatures. Go figure. <laughs> well, that about does it for us. We hope to see you back here next week. In the meantime, don't forget to introduce a kid to the great outdoors. Transportation provided by Premier Transportation. Call 1-800-899-7433.